Hi, Mikael. Hi. Um, yeah, I think you can start now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, a very good afternoon, dearest parents and ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome on behalf of Beacon House, a warm welcome to all of you for today's uh, parenting talk. We have something very exciting uh, planned up for all parents. So sit back and enjoy this afternoon presentation. But before I introduce uh, today's speakers, speaker to all of you, I have some housekeeping uh, to look into. Firstly, uh, we will seek your cooperation to keep your mic muted during the whole entire session. All right, remember to mute your mic. And, and please be informed that uh, we will not be taking any uh, questions during the presentation, Present, but you will have a chance uh, for during the Q&A session at the end uh, of the presentation. Or you may like to type your question into the uh, chat room and we will look into your question uh, at the end of the pre presentation. All right, so I believe you're all already uh, for the presentation, but there's one more thing I would like to do that, that is, I would like to set the stage for the presentation on play this afternoon. This is for the benefit of those who are new to Beacon House school system. Uh, for those of parents who are with us, uh, you, will, you will know that we have been subscribing to the play philosophy for a long time, all right, because Play has been uh, the center of curriculum for all our preschool and for all uh, BNEY. We have subscribed to the active form of learning since 2004, about 17 years ago in Malaysia, as far as play is concerned. In other words, all our subjects are framed uh, as activities where children will experience first-hand learning and they will be uh, going through a lot of hands-on uh, activities in the daily lessons. But over the years, our play-based learning has evolved. We have evolved now into, into introducing play-based learning activities with a more focused uh, learning objective, such as the STEM activities and the forest school activities. So we continue, Beacon House Malaysia continue to subscribe to the belief that play uh, is an important vehicle for learning and it's going to bring our children uh, and you help children to develop their 21st century skill. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, always remember play is still very relevant even, even today because it's a very powerful uh, vehicle of learning. So today we are very privileged to have a very qualified and a trained speaker uh, to share with us to give us uh, uh, more information or enlighten us further on the effectiveness and the values of play. Of course, she is none other than Miss Carrie Wong. Uh, Miss Carrie Wong, uh, in fact, she's the current director of Kin and Kids Marriage, Family and Child Therapy Center in PJ. She is a qualified and a certified marriage and family therapist. She is a counseling psychologist, a registered play therapist in the US. She also has been a practicing lawyer in the past. So in short, she's very, very uh, qualified and she is an authority in this subject of play. So this afternoon, we will hear from her. She will definitely, I'm very sure that she's going to enlighten us further on the effectiveness and the values of play. So without wasting much time, uh, over to you, Karis. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share screen. And just let me know whether this works. OK, are you able to see my screen? Yes. OK, great, great. Oh, just give me a second. Let me shop. I forgot I need to share, optimize, and share sound. Sorry about that. Okay, all right. So um, thank you for this opportunity uh, to share a little bit about play. I have four little kids at home and uh, I really do enjoy playing with them. And uh, I was privileged to... Yeah, 
Psychotherapy Training Center in the world. And that was my first exposure to actually learning to use play in a therapeutic form to support children's well-being. And uh, this has really been an invaluable experience for me because I never realized back then that I will end up with four kids. And it really has been a very significant part of my learning experience as a mom in learning how to bond with my kids. So not just in my professional work, working with kids professionally as a therapist and families, but also in my personal life. And so today, <clears throat> as I was preparing for the talk, you know, one of my sons was coming and looking and seeing what I was doing. And I said, well, I am going to share with parents about play and how important play is to children. Uh, what do you think about that? And he says, oh yeah, I think that's a good idea. So this talk is supported by my kids as well. All right, well. Children play. Uh, and why do we play therapy? Why do I use play therapy in my work therapeutically with children? Well, at my center, I have two, two offices and each office has two normal therapy rooms. That's, when, that's the rooms that we use with adults and with, uh, with our families. But we also have a dedicated play therapy room in each one of the center. And when we see kids, we don't bring them to that adult therapy room that has the traditional sofa and armchair. We bring them into the play room where they can take out their shoes, they can uh, sit on the floor, and they can walk around and they can explore and decide uh, what toys or what mediums they want to use in play therapy. And why do we do that? Because um, as play therapy, as a play therapist, I believe that uh, play is a natural medium of expression for children. And children do lack the cognitive capacity to express ourselves using And in a play-based environment, we are comfortable to be ourselves because the environment represents what we are used to. And so if you expect a child to sit down and to talk to you, that is very, very misconceived. And children feel in control when they are in a play-based environment because they're, it's comfortable, they're familiar with it, and the toys are their words. In fact, this is actually enshrined in the UN Convention of the Rights of Children, that every child has the right to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities, and to participate freely in cultural life and arts. So this is why it is against human rights for children to engage in child labor, for children to be a part of the slavery system. And uh, because children, part of the developmental growth of the children is to be able to participate freely. In fact, Aristotle, as we know, one of the wisest men on the earth philosophers said, you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. So I am also a psychologist. I am trained to do testing and psychoeducational assessments with adults and children. And when I am doing an evaluation with a child and I want to get more information about a child's social, emotional well-being, rather than giving a, my child a questionnaire for them to answer or rather than giving them a face-to-face -face sit down and interview, I take the kids to the playroom. And in the playroom, I am able to get so much information about them as I get to know them and the parents are fascinated when I tell them that this is what your child thinks and this is what your child feels and this is what is important to your child and this is what your child is said about. Um, but this is really true what Aristotle said. The four healing messages of therapeutic play. So when we are in a therapeutic in itself, and this is what Gary Landruff, who is the region professor at my university, had to say. The first one is, I am here. So when we're playing with children, we need to be fully present. It means that I'm here and this is your special hour. And I am here joining in this special hour with you. I am going to put aside whatever distractions and I am going to be fully here to engage with you and uh, work hard to enter 
know and to understand what you're trying to tell me. I am not here to psychoanalyze or to evaluate you, and I'm not here to tell you what to do. The second message is, I hear you. I hear what you are trying to tell me. I hear what you're communicating to me, and I am able to take care of myself so that when you tell me things, whether they are positive or negative to me, I am able to rest. Understand that I'm listening to you rather than to be reactive and start worrying whether, oh, this means that I have failed as a parent or without feeling stress and trying to need to pacify you or uh, to... Uh, to see, and I am able to see you as a separate person from myself, so I don't get enmeshed uh, or and I don't get anxious when I'm with you. The third one is that I understand. So I understand what you're trying to say. I understand your feelings, whether they are positive feelings or whether they are feelings that are uh, negative, such as that you're angry, you're lonely, you're sad, you're anxious. I understand. And I can convey my understanding of your feelings to you. And this is really, really important. That was once I was away overseas for two, year, two weeks and um, one of my sons was really experiencing the impact of missing me. And so my aunt uh, on the bed, very quiet and very silent. And he's usually a very joyful, chatty boy. And so very instinctively, she went and she sat next to him and she says, hey, you know, I know it's hard. I know you miss your mommy, you know? And he sits down there and tears roll down his eye, uh, eyes. And many, many years later, my son, who was five back then, yeah, and he's just the nine, he said that, you know, Auntie understands and auntie cares because she knew how I felt when you were not around. So that connection, that empathy, that affirmation of the emotion is really important when we play. I care. So I care about you. I care. You are important to me. And I understand that I cannot make you grow faster than what you are ready. That uh, you will learn at your own pace and I will not push you. Uh, just yesterday, the uh, son, who is slightly delayed in learning, had revealed to him that a few years ago, when he was in preschool, he was actually scolded and beaten by the teacher assistant, who was very, very frustrated because despite teaching him again and again, he just couldn't learn and he just couldn't remember and write his alphabets. And that experience was traumatic for the child because... Uh, now, as he's going to uh, primary one and going into a new school, he's getting very anxious and saying, will the teacher scold me? Will they cane me? You know, will I get beaten? Will I get embarrassed? Uh, and so one incident like that can have quite a strong impact on the child. So let's look at a traditional classroom environment. Yeah, um, If you buy a Peppa Pig toy for your kid, they are going to automatically arrange the table and chair like this because this is what they are used to. But I see a little girl who has never been to school because of the COVID and who pretty much had to grow up at home. Arrange them like that because that's not her experience. But for those of us who have been in a traditional classroom, we will remember the road memory lessons where we are being taught in a traditional blackboard style. We are taught to use um, uh, worksheets and um, the teacher is giving us a great deal of oral teaching. We're expected to sit down at our desk and to listen. Uh, the environment is very structured and disciplined and then uh, we are assessed how much we are learned through an examination. This is very, very traditional. Uh, but then there is a lot of research about play-based learning now. And now we are wiser and we learn better about what works best for kids. And, it, uh, and therefore there has been changes in our learning environment for our kids. So our kids benefit a lot from a play-based learning environment as shown by a lot of the research journals 
And this is one of it that uh, um, shared Before that, uh, this article actually uh, identifies four main features of play-based learning. The first one is that it's usually voluntary. So we don't, the kid is not being forced to do anything they don't want to do. Uh, and we try as much as possible to engage the child through play. And because play is fun, uh, the child is more open to engaging in the activity. Um, it is intrinsically motivated, meaning that we are looking for the child to want to engage in a task, to want to learn because they, they, they feel excited about it. They want to do it, not because they are being forced to do it, or not because they're afraid of being caned. Yeah? So I don't need to get a trophy or I don't need to get first in class. I don't need to get 100 on my exam, but I just want to learn because I want to get better and I want to master a new skill. Play-based learning also involves some level of activity uh, and it often involves physical engagement, which means that um, the, the child is not just passive sitting down there. Involved in the learning process. And finally, it is distinctive from other behaviors because in play, there is a huge make-believe element. And if you know anything, if you observe children, you know that make-believe and fantasy is so much of their world. And that increases the fun element and the pleasurable element of play-based learning. So when we are engaging in play-based learning, it is very, very experiential experience. And children are learning through the use of their five senses. So we imagine compared to a traditional uh, classroom blackboard, uh, style of teaching where the child is just sitting still and listening and looking at the blackboard and if she's they're typically not even looking at pictures or anything interesting on the blackboard it's just a lot of numbers and words compared to a play-based learning where a child is uh, learning hands engaging in hands-on learning and is involving the five senses so in not just from what the teacher is showing them, but also by looking at their peers and their classmates. Uh, they are getting feedback, not just from the teachers, but also from their classmates. They are free to ask for help, not just from their teachers, but also from their classmates. And they are free to also help their classmates who may need help in whatever project that they're doing. And whatever project that they're doing, whether it is painting or assembling something, uh, they, their hands are active and there is a tactile sensation there. And if, it's, um, if they're using wood or if they're using something, their sense of smell may also be triggered. So there is a lot of sensory experience in play-based uh, learning. There you go. These are the five senses just here to remind you that not only the sight and the hearing uh, is important, but also the rest of the senses. So if we're gonna put, I just make this chart so that we can have a side-by-side -side comparison of traditional learning and play-based learning. Right? Uh, it is learning naturally through play and, play and imitation. Uh, we spoke about it being more experiential and instead of demanding obedience, uh, in a sedentary discipline setting, children are actually learning. They're doing, they're having hands-on learning in terms of how to practice classroom etiquette. And they're getting direct feedback from their teachers and their classmates about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And um, it's activity-based, there's physical engagement. I think this is really important for the kinesthetic child learner. So we don't assume that all children learn best visually or all children learn best auditory. There is a third category of children who are kinesthetic uh, learners. And kinesthetic means that they need to have that tactile feeling. Their hands need to be moving because that's the, their best way of learning. In play-based learning, exams are not so important, but rather the teacher is able to have ongoing assessment and, and the focus is not just on results, but it's on the effort, is on the process, and is, is on cultivating the intrinsic motivation of the child. So here are some other um, comparisons that I have. 
I was, I remember being a very hyperactive child. And so, you know, I really wasn't good in sitting down and listening at the blackboard. Either I would get into trouble because I would start talking to my friends or I would be doing something else like reading storybook underneath the table. Or if I really have to sit still, I would zone out and go out into my daydream world. So it really didn't work for me. I can tell you I was blurred from kindy all the way, but not so much kindy because kindy was more active, but from standard one all the way up to standard form six, I was super blurred. I didn't know what was going on in school. So yeah, it really didn't work for me. And if you see this, I don't know. These days, uh, if you see this, we see teacher talk and talk and there's not much engagement going on. And that's, that's really sad because uh, learning is supposed to be fun and engaging and play ensures that the learning is voluntary, engaging, stimulating, and pleasurable. So um, that's in the classroom, but what about play at home? So when parents are with kids, um, one thing that I really do like to encourage is for parents to engage and to encourage free and spontaneous play experiences by their children. This means minimal rules, okay? Uh, the rules are there to protect the uh, environment, to protect the materials that you're using and to protect the child and people around. But other than that, the rules should be kept to the minimal. Uh, there is no specific objectives in a sense that the object is not for you to make that perfect sandwich. The object is not for you to don't need to produce 10 miniatures of the same picture that the art teacher is showing. Or rather, I would run you to creatively explore your own drawing and draw your own picture. So it is definitely child-led. Parents do not instruct, do not direct. Parents' job is just to provide the materials and let the child explore. And the play is open-ended. So sometimes we don't know where the play is gonna go, but we should be okay with the ambiguity. And it's spontaneous and instinctive. So let the toys or let the materials speak to your child and let them explore in a way that is meaningful for them. So the sandwich doesn't have to be perfect, yeah? Just let the kid decide what, how they want their sandwich to be. Why is free play important? Uh, so in school, I mean, especially when we are in physical school, which unfortunately now most kids don't get to go back to their kindy. But in kindergarten, typically, there play-based learning activity. For example, if they're learning math, they're using um, different beats to count, or they're using blocks, or they're you know, putting numbers in containers. So that's more play-based. Uh, and then there is also the free play, where the kids just get free time to play. And the other day, my son was telling me about Boys Brigade that they used to attend uh, ever since they were six years old. And he said his most favorite time in Boys Brigade was the free play time, you know, and there they were just, teachers would just give them time just to play and run around and do whatever they like. And that was the best part of Boys Brigade. So why is free play important? Well, in free play, children get to express their feelings right? Rather than just sitting down there and saying, how do you feel today? The kid's going to go, I don't know. So you, rather than asking a child how they feel, which is pretty good, by observing their play, you comfortable way. Children also have an opportunity to, to true play, to play out their experiences. So for example, Right now we are in COVID and lots of kids cannot go to school. And the kids that are really struggling are the kids who are single children, who do not have siblings and who do not have the opportunity to interact socially with, um, with, with other kids, which is really sad, right? Um, some of these kids that I see in the playroom, this is their only opportunity to play out the experiences that they do not get to enjoy in their everyday life. So my little three-year-old kid, two, two and a half, three-year-old kid comes into the playroom and she gets into the playground 
She gets to play with her. Uh, she gets Peppa to play with Peppa Pig's friends. She gets Peppa and her friends to take turns as they go around the merry-go-round. They take turns as they fly around the helicopter. My other kid, who's also a single child. And the party is so popular that everyone in town is queuing up to wait for the party. And the moment the, the door is open, everyone rushes into the house. And the, the house is just full of people. There are people everywhere in the house. There are people sitting outside, there are people in the bathtub, there are people on the bed, there are people on the balcony. And that is what she's getting to do now. And so I am at least giving them an opportunity to, to do something that they should be able to do in their everyday life, but that they have not been able to uh, due to COVID. And children also need a place to process what they have learned in everyday life uh, because they're not just seeing, observing, but they're also needing to, to process and to think about it and to reflect about it. And play gives them an opportunity to play out that uh, experiences. So when you see your kids playing masak masak, they're not just playing masak masak, they're processing that food is an important part of life. They're processing, they're playing out Masak, masak, when they come to you and they give you a dish, they are learning to care for you. There is a nurturing quality about it. They are saying, I care for you. I'm preparing a meal for you. I want to see you happy with the food that I've done for you. And I did this just for you. So that's the opportunity that children get during free play. Children can also try new things and learn more about how the world works. So if a child is not confident in their social skills, but using dolls, role play, they can build that competency. And so they can transfer these skills out uh, in their real life and learn uh, to apply these skills that they've learned through their play. Play offers you an opportunity to practice as a child. Play also builds confidence and improves self-esteem because you are moving at a child's own pace when they engage in free play. So there is no stress, there is no pressure to meet that end result because the process is more important than the end result. Free and spontaneous play experiences at home, uh, provide the materials, let the child direct its own play, create their own structure and be creative. Uh, I, got, I did this before. And when a child plays, they're basically playing four things. One is they're playing about the past. So the, the child plays what they have experienced. They had a kid whose parents were arguing a lot. And one day the kid takes her two dolls and starts to have these two dolls quarrel with each other because she is projecting her parents' argument uh, in her play. So that's the past. Um, children are also processing their reaction and their feelings towards whatever they have experienced. Then they are also projecting uh, what they hope or what they want for the future. So they can engage in a fantasy play, which may reflect some of their deepest needs. How they feel about themselves, we can see it through their play. If you sit down and observe a child's play, you'll know whether this is a happy, well-adjusted child or whether this child has got some uncertainty or some lack of confidence through their play. I'm just going to show you a video of how my kids learn through free and spontaneous play. So this was many years ago before COVID. <laughs> to have um, the lion dance come during Chinese New Year to our condo. And they were really excited to watch the lion dance. And then um, not long after that, uh, one night, this is what they did on their own. So the 
kids did it on their own, yeah. They set up their own structure. We didn't even have any line dance for them. Uh, they just did it on their own uh, and they were playing what they saw and learning through it. Yeah, it's their own creative, spontaneous play. And let's not rob that from the kids. What's the opposite of a free, spontaneous play? It's children who are screen time zombies, who are addicted to the screen. And this is a very, very ongoing challenge, especially during this COVID time. So many kids these days are getting glued to the screen uh, because uh, they can't go out. And it's, it's a tough time. It's a tough time for kids and it's a tough time for parents who still have to go to work and who now have the double role of Um, and uh, a few years ago, about four or five years ago, Inti University did a research on the digital natives, that is kids who are born in a digital era. And they found that um, our digital native children are connected to the internet for more than eight hours a day. And when I asked my teen clients, how many hours a day are you connected to the internet? They tell me that it is at least 12 to 16 hours a day. And children are getting less sleep because they are on the screen at night talking to their friends or doing something or gaming. Uh, they are also um, so connected to the screen that they are disconnected from the family. So they rather stay in their room being on the screen rather than be out and being engaging with the family. Um, and so the, the cultivating good habits starts from a young age. I believe that. Uh, I'm, I'm getting some comments from some of the parents that I really admire. Parents longer than me. And one of my friends uh, who is really into uh, instilling creativity and free play among her kids says, I don't want my kids to grow up being entertained by the TV or the gadget. So there is a strong emphasis on craft and nature as an alternative way to keep them occupied. This is another one of my uh, good friends from school. Uh, she has got three girls and she's really super busy. She's a high flying director, uh, but she's always, you know, you spending her free time and engaging with her girls and doing all kinds of craft and activities. She started this uh, Facebook group called Gadget Free Kids as well. And um, she says experiences and unstructured play are very important. Exposure to real life learning, uh, social interaction and exploration will further nurture their problem-solving abilities and increase their creativity and imagination. So that's why she puts effort in doing this. Uh, but, you know, I knew what COVID was. Um, I gave a talk on outdoor and natural parenting. And the talk was focused on getting kids outdoor and getting kids engaged in nature because nature is the child's biggest learner. And now, you know, this talk is, you know, there are lots of things in the talk that cannot apply in today because we are still in a movement control order and kids still have very, very limited movement. And that's really sad because our children have lost the freedom to explore the world through nature, through being outdoors. And that's really, really sad. So what happens when children are kept indoors too long? This happens. They start to create a mess. Rather, I like to reframe it. They start to look for ways to be creative and to have their own sensory play. These are my kids many years ago when they are left alone just for a few seconds. See, they love the sensory play. Kids really, really want it. They will, if you don't give them the opportunity, they will find ways to do it themselves. So parents, my challenge is allow your kids to be a bit messy, allow them the opportunity for sensory play, especially because they cannot go out right now. Let them explore, let them get dirty, strip them off their clothes, let them play in the bathroom. So this is the bathroom before we clean the bathroom. Um, find water soluble paints, find ways where they can engage in sensory play and be messy and minimize the mess for you to clean up. Be okay with the mess. 
be okay with the mess. Um, one of my friends who's a medical doctor and who really also believes uh, in, uh, uh, these are the pictures that she showed of her daughter growing up. And she says, I want to be a mom who interacts with my kids who can be in their shoes. It is a huge useful tool, God given natural tool, I believe that can help us bond with our children. And um, as I end, here are two of my challenges to you. First one is, despite your busy COVID life, juggling so many things, how would you incorporate more free and spontaneous play in your day, child's daily life? How? And it doesn't have to be long. It could be, let's just taking part of the weekend just to chill and play with your kids. It could be, um, buying that Lego and building things together. It could be um, buying a pack of cards or it could be doing some art together. It could be um, baking cookies together and letting your child to decorate the cookies in any way they like. How would you do that? Because that's so important. That's more important than the academic learning. The second challenge is what specific skill, what specific skill can you mindfully incorporate into your play? So I've listed some tips here and maybe just pick up one or two and say, I'm gonna to try to be more conscious of this the next time I play with my kid. So can you be more child directed and, less inst and provide less instruction to your kid? So when you're playing masat masat to your kid and your kid says, Daddy, what would you like me to cook for you? For what would you like me to cook for you? Instead of saying, I want you to cook for me a very delicious roti chanai with lots of chicken curry, can you say, Well, why don't you surprise me? And why don't you cook me your special dish? Can you follow the child's pace instead of moving too fast ahead of your child? So if a child is having difficulty opening a container, instead of rushing to help your child open it, can you sit to ask you to help? And can you ask your child, what would you like me to do instead of rushing to save your child or to get everything done for your child? When you're playing with your child, can you be fully present? Can you put away your handphone? Can you turn off the TV? Can you say, for the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna give you 100% of my time. I'm gonna be fully present with you. I'm not gonna think about what we're gonna have for dinner. I'm not gonna think about the assignment that my boss is waiting for me. I'm just gonna be there with you and I'm gonna be fully present. Can you let the child problem solve instead of initiating a solution? Can you let the child find creative ways maybe when they're facing a challenge in their play? Can you be more sensitive in reflecting your child's feeling, whether they are positive or negative feelings? And instead of rushing to pacify our children so that they will feel better, can we we haven't we've haven't had the opportunity to go for holidays in the past two years? I know you miss flying. Can we say it's it's it sucks you've, you've not been able to see your school friends for a long time and I know you're feeling lonely. Can we reflect that feeling and just connect to our children at a more emotional level? So that's all I have for today. And thank you for listening. I was given 35 minutes. <laughs> I'm really happy that I finished on time. So I'm giving back the time back to Beacon House. Thank you. Thank you, Mika. It has been very enlightening and definitely you have reinforced uh, the values of play. Before we open the Q&A session, before I allow, uh, or before you take up any question, we have the privilege to ask the first question, yeah? Okay. 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 Uh, I, I was rather uh, uh, keen when you shared the four healing messages of uh, therapeutic play a while ago or rather at the beginning of your presentation. 
you, you mentioned, I'm here, I hear you, I understand, I care, all right? I thought these are very uh, uh, important and because uh, as a teacher or as a parent, it's the same. The bonding factor is very, very important. If you do not bond with them, you just, uh, just like a radio, you just blast whatever instruction, you know, it's not going to be effective. Can you give us a little bit of a, 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 a peep into how do you do it? How do you demonstrate, let's say you're with a child or with, with a small group of children, how do you demonstrate I'm here, I hear you, I understand and I care, you know? Um, firstly, to take out all distractions and be prepared and say, this time is dedicated for you. Uh, I think it's uh, perhaps easier for teachers because that's their job. Uh, it's harder for parents because we are trying to have to do that. Uh, and being very aware that the kid actually moves at their own pace. So for example, we know the story of the butterfly. This man saw a butterfly trying to emerge from a cocoon. And the man thought that he would help the struggling butterfly by tearing a bit of the cocoon off uh, because the butterfly was struggling and struggling and struggling. But as a result of that, when the butterfly came out, it was for, it could not fly properly for the rest of its life because it didn't kind of develop that muscle strength in order to push itself out of the cocoon. And sometimes we do that with the kids, right? We get frustrated because they can't learn as fast as we think or we hope that they, they can. Um, but it's, it's saying, I understand that you need a bit more time in this. I understand. And we're going to get through this together. Yeah. Right. And, and I can't. frustrated. I understand that um, you feel embarrassed that you cannot do as well as your classmates and that you're sad. Yeah. And then uh, I care for you. I want you to be happy. I think that's more important. The relationship without the relationship is more important than the materials or the resources that we use in whatever play, uh, whatever learning, because you we know, like I work with so many kids and I do testing and the kids tell me they do well in this class, uh, not because they, they just like the subject, that's part of the reason, but also because they like the teacher. And so even though it's not a subject that they like, because they like the teacher, they're motivated by the teacher and they're motivated to do their homework and they're motivated to learn. So the, 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 the therapeutic agent, uh, which is the teacher or the parent, is definitely more important than the play activity or than the materials used in play. Right. right. I think what you say is very, very true. Uh, uh, as a teacher or as, or as an educator, language and communication skill is very, very important, regardless whether we are in a physical classroom or we are doing a virtual classroom. I think language skill... Uh, able to express and able to help your 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 students to express and, and the way you communicate, I think is uh, it means a lot. Lah. You you either uh, deter learning or you encourage uh, learning. I hear it from you very clearly. Thank you. So, is there any other question from the floor for Karis? Can anyone help us to check on the chat room? Is there any question? I'm so looking at the chat group. Uh, so yeah. far, it's quite silent. Oh, okay. <laughs> How are you parents doing today? Uh, today is Saturday. After uh, another busy week, how are you all feeling? And you're okay. You can just type out whatever you feel here. I tell you, I am feeling... Talk and then... I will be free for the rest of the day. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Yes. Um, sorry, can you recap the four elements that you mentioned earlier? I, I understand. I, I, I'm, I'm here. here. I hear you. I, I understand. I okay. care. That is from Carrie's here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's the... It's the first thing we actually learn in play therapy training. 
how to be, how to be with the child, right? Not so much how to help the child. The four messages that my professor, Dr. Gary Landra said. Yeah. Yeah. Play, in fact, is uh, from, my, from my understanding, of course, what we, uh, the play that we advocate in school will be very uh, much based on educational play. Uh, of course, we will try and make it as, as more open-ended as possible. Because basically in play, there are two types of play. One is the ludic play, whereby it is just uh, uh, playing repeatedly uh, with the same item. Well, is there a value there? Yes, but very minimum value. But then if it, if it's, if it's uh, as, as pretending play, then it will be a play that is very meaningful. You will encourage uh, the child to explore, uh, to, to go and discover further. That's what we, we're trying to do in a school, school environment. That's the reason why uh, now, if uh, after the COVID, in fact, before the COVID, we've been doing that. We, if can, we like to bring the child outdoor as what Carrie's have uh, advocated. The outdoor is, uh, is a great place uh, to learn. So when, when they go out there, uh, but they don't just go out there and run uh, aimlessly. Okay, we want uh, uh, epistemic play, whereby we give them, give them sort of a task. We want them to go and find rocks of different sizes. We want them to go and find leaves of different shapes, you know. So th th that is what uh, we have been uh, advocating. And then whatever they're collected back into the classroom, that's where we also advocate uh, another level of, of learning, a very purposeful play, uh, educational play. That's where the STEM activities come in, whereby they will explore, they will bring in technology, they will bring in science, you know, uh, and so forth uh, into the classroom. So, yeah. So play, indeed, it is a very powerful, uh, a powerful vehicle for learning. And, and uh, in fact, uh, it is a lot of parents still asking us, is it relevant for today? Is it relevant for tomorrow? Uh, what do you think, uh, Karis? Definitely. And I think a lot of kids forget to play because they got so hooked up with the screen and uh, online gaming. And uh, online gaming is different from the natural, uh, free and spontaneous play. It's totally different, yeah? Uh, online gaming is designed to keep you hooked on it. It has got, um, it gives you a very fast uh, dopamine boost. Uh, so the pleasure, pleasure uh, hormones from the dopamine comes up very fast when you play. And then, then you have to, keep working, keep working, keep working. So there is the addictive element, whereas we want the dopamine boost to come out by working or by uh, more through a natural engagement. So for example, when kids are out and they're running and they're playing sports, they also get the dopamine boost. Uh, when they are having fun, uh, when they're rolling around and, and tickle and playing tickle and laugh with uh, the mom and dad, that there's a dopamine boost, that's the pleasure hormones. And that's a more natural way of getting our dopamine, <laughs> dopamine hormones, our pleasure hormones up. In fact, in fact, uh, currently what we all are facing because of the lockdown and because of the MCO and so on, you know, a lot of questions have, have surfaced. Of course, ideally play will be in the fiscal school. Okay, you can go out to the great outdoor to play. This morning, I was at uh, uh, another uh, webinar where I was one of the panel speakers. We were debating, you know, can play be, be introduced, you know, virtually? So... What, what's your take? Do you think it can be done? This is an ongoing challenge, I think, for teachers as, as well as us who work with kids. Yeah. And um, they've tried doing like a virtual sanitary therapy, virtual dollhouse. Um, I think we're all trying our best. It's never going to replace the tangible, uh, sensorial based play. Uh, but there are ways to do it uh, because uh, doing online gives us the opportunity for kids to do show and tell, for example. Uh, you can do a scavenger's hunt. Uh, it's interesting. You can show, uh, like, you know, this is the first time we are able to look and see a, ch a child's home or their child's room, or they can show us our pets. So the, as long as you incorporated a incorporate a fun element, uh, to to your online learning, I think this will engage the kids. So I think even in uh, 
cookies or cow food. And it's fun. It's fun for the kids. And it's really more engaging. We can't do the blackboard teaching. One thing that we know, <laughs> blackboard teaching doesn't work know. for online school. It doesn't work at all. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm with you. In fact, this morning, uh, all the educators also feel that whether we like it or not, it's definitely not going to replace phys physical school. But the reality is that we do not know uh, when the, this pandemic is going to end and will there be another pandemic that's coming on. We cannot afford to let our children either at home. Uh, we must ensure that uh, uh, there's no interruptive uh, learning. So, yeah. So I think the next phase of learning for the school of tomorrow, we, we, are, we are now all looking at, we need to explore the digital world. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, uh, things coming up in the digital world that will promote more uh, interaction. I think what we want children to, uh, to interact more interaction, the better it will be. Uh, interacting with the material or the program, interacting with the peers and interacting with the teachers. I think that will be the quantum leap. I'm very sure uh, in the near future, we will see uh, much more of, of this area because uh, I think uh, moving forward, I think there will be, we have to provide options for parents, either go attend a phys physical school when you can, or you may have your reason to do homeschooling, you will you will want to continue with your virtual learning, or the school may have to have to provide uh, both uh, what, what we call hybrid learning. You know, certain days we do we do, uh, we can do physical together uh, uh, with uh, virtual learning and things like that. That will be something that uh, I could look into the future. What what would you, what we personally feel about the future about our early years education? You're asking me, is it? Yeah. What's your thought? Do you think for, for the future? I, know, I think the main reason for, especially at the kindergarten level, right, why we are still having online school for our kids, um, I think it's, it's really familiar faces online to engage, to have that a little bit of social interaction with their teacher and their friends. Uh, I, I think all of us parents, after almost two years of COVID and MCO, are accepting the fact that our kids are not going to learn as fast as the kids who got to go to school. We're accepting it that, you know, they're going to be a bit slow in their academics. So we just do what we can, uh, but at the same time, focus on what's important. That's the social, emotional development of our children. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Cl Clarice. It has been, as I said earlier, very enlightening. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for, for sharing. Uh, if there's any other question from parents, if they, if they were to write into us, then we, we may forward it to you. But thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time spent with us this afternoon. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Yeah. Thank you.